Okay, thank you. Now is the time to grill all these gentlemen. Um, if by going by, if, if Daniel wasn't here, we would all think that we've all solved the problems. Everybody's very enthusiastic about GPLv3 in cars, and we have solutions to all the issues. That's what's happening from the paper and what everyone said. But uh, that which we call a rose by any other name would not smell as sweet here. Because uh, what Evan and Mark call um, innovation, Daniel calls them user-made maybe manipulation. And um, so humans driving cars is already a complicated process. And now we're moving to autonomous vehicles. Um, and the limiting factor, obviously, is always safety. So there's always, there are already so many complications. Now you want to add GPLv3 and give people exactly what? The freedom to tinker with the car. So um, I, I want to ask you, you're deaf, are you all in agreement that there is no future of cars without free and open source software? And I want you to talk about that agreement, which obviously has a lot of disagreement built in. Uh, Daniel? Yeah, if I start, uh, and that's what I wanted to point out uh, during my presentation. I think there is a future of uh, open source software in, in the cars. This is a fact which I can see every day. So there is already open source software in the cars, and there's definitely the future. I remember, and I just mentioned that when we were standing together uh, some years ago, some, some people said, okay, we want to block that entirely. And I said, hang on a minute, we cannot, and, and we should not do that. And this is not the way forward. So I was always encouraging people to take a very precise look at what we are talking about so that we can enable, we can, ha we can show the boundaries and enable um, uh, software innovation to, c to get to the cars um, within the, the boundaries which are important to us. Mark, what is trusting software? It's not just knowing the provenance of software, but it's also about what you talk in the paper about how software governance is managed. Daniel also talked about partitioning. So can you uh, talk a little bit more about, in that context, future of FOSS in cars I'm, and I'm, how you see it? I guess I'm reminded of that. I think I've got one working now. Is that working? I'm reminded of that old sort of 1980s Cold War, trust but verify. Um, and I think, with hindsight, that was a pretty savvy view, that, that ultimately trust isn't a simplistic thing it's best if it's backed by um, uh, science, it's best if it's backed by facts, uh, and possibly if it's backed by, by teeth as well. Um, so <clears throat> why do we trust something? Because we believe it will be um, a predictable outcome. We believe we can predict the outcome. And I think <clears throat> what's, what I observe in the industry is that we're, we're going through that gradient of going from trust is this sort of nebulous thing um, at a very high level uh, that's almost tribal and branded, you know. Uh, and now we're getting down to a sharper, pointier, more, almost more useful definition of what do I need to trust and do I or do I not trust that for that, effectively. Daniel, you want to jump in and also talk about how you think this trust plays out, how the car really works, what you lock down what you keep open yeah i think also here we have to look where we need trust i think if we look at the overall car of course not only we want to have trust that everything works well but also the customer of course wants to have trust that everything uh, works well um, at the end of the day also the trust is part of the permission of 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 the car and i think this is one of the the key issues here, the re regulatory side as well. So as long as they say there's a tr there's a there's trust, and also from a re regulatory side, um, uh, there is a permission to it. Um, however, I think we have to distinguish, and 
I'm, I don't have an, a clear answer on that uh, right now, but we have to distinguish where we really need trust and maybe we have a more, more of a freedom to, um, to, to um, back up a little bit and, and say maybe here in that area of the car, uh, trust is not so necessary, but in other areas, trust is very, very important. Yeah, I mean, I, the, the, the difficulty here is that trust is a different concept when you're not bending metal, you're making software. The way that the vehicle OEMs got trust in the physical automobile was by saying, please use only General Motors replacement parts, please use only our approved spark plugs, please this, please that. And the idea was that somebody manufactures a trusted thing and then there's a whole bunch of people out there who manufacture untrusted things. Please use the trusted objects and then your car will perform correctly. That's not a 21st century concept anymore. Now we have the problem of no software is ever perfect. Therefore, the idea that what you do is you manufacture a TiVoized car, you put some software in it, you lock the software down, and that software works until the car dies is never going to be correct. It's never going to work that way. The problem with the idea of TiVoization is that it establishes trust at the moment the car leaves the factory. And now you are trusting all the defects in the software for the life of the car. Nobody really believes that. Therefore, we are talking about an environment in which we're going to have to have software replaceable parts. And we're having a discussion about who we trust to make and replace those parts. This is in the end trust in people, not trust in software. Trust in software is just a reflection of trust in persons. What the reorganization of VW reminds us of this week, yet again, is that the idea that the only trusted persons are the manufacturers is also not going to be correct. We talk about this highly regulated market, but we now understand the VW case was extremely useful in this too, that regulators are not going to find the problems in the software. Civil society is going to find the problems in the software. This is 100% guaranteed to be true. Mathematically, it's true. The regulators will never employ enough people. There are not enough taxes in the world to employ enough regulators to check all the software. Civil society is therefore going to be responsible for inspecting and discovering failures in software. That means FOSS by design, because otherwise we're using unsafe, uninspectable building materials. And now the problem is, so you have inspected and you have found a problem, then what? You write a letter to the automobile manufacturer and you say, you guys ought to get around to fixing this one of these days. You write to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, say, I found a bug. Would you please recall all these automobiles for me? None of the existing mechanisms will work with respect to what is going to be the most complex, the most dangerous, and the most widespread bunch of software in civil society. We're going to have to figure out ways to govern, repair, modify, and use it that don't depend on trust in a brand on the side of a spark plug box. Again, says, um, um, take the principles, what FOSS teaches you, but not necessarily the license itself, because openness comes in, and all regulators would like some throat to choke when there is a problem. So yes, and it won't be a legal throat to choke. It isn't a copyright lawsuit against somebody. It's a technical set of facilities that operate software and vehicles in such a way that regulators, users, manufacturers, parts manufacturers, and third-party service entities can together optimize the mix of software in the vehicle at any given moment, given where it is and what it's doing. And that's going to turn out to require more sensitive mechanisms than either free fire zone, it's all open, sometimes it gets fixed at annual checkup or 50,000 miles or 100,000 miles, or every Johnny and Sally makes whatever changes she wants to her automobile. Neither one of those are going to be accepted. Somewhere in between, there has to be a way of doing that more sensitively. And that has to be not a legal set of rules, it has to be a, a technical set supported by law, uh, where, where we can use contracts and copyright law and other legal machinery to keep everybody to it, but without acceptable technical solutions for the very complicated problem of governance as a technical matter, we're not going to wind up with what we want. If automobiles are TiVoized in the 21st century 
and nobody can change the software in them but the manufacturers. Manufacturers are going to wind up very unhappy because they're going to be responsible for a nightmare of liability problems as software ages and conditions change and they're the only people who can fix it. One of the reasons that I think it's so important to talk about these liability issues is I think at the moment the automotive manufacturers think that the best way to avoid liability is to control it all themselves, thus piling up all the liability in their hands. And I think what Mark and Jeremiah and I are all saying in different ways is that's not the right long-term solution. Doesn't optimize innovation, doesn't optimize liability protection, requires you to be vertically integrated servicers of long lifetime safety critical software forever. Are you really sure you want to be in that business? So my question is, does your client really want to be in the business? Does your client, Audi, really want to be in that business of centralizing in itself all liability for software <laughs> problems forever and being the only point of repair for TiVoized software in cars? Um, a good question. Um, I think, um, of course, of all, of course, to a certain extent, we want to and have to control um, a, a big bunch of it as long as we don't have uh, real solutions. Because liability is probably twofolded. Uh, the liability, as you mentioned, uh, um, I, I can understand and I, I see that point as well. But also um, from a liability, product liability side, um, the, the government or the, the courts, they um, have also some obligations on the on the uh, manufacturer, so you have to um, look at what is being done with your car, with your car system, with your software, and if you see that someone is doing something, you will also have to um, control this, or at least uh, anal analysis, uh, analysis, do analysis of, of that, and um, you are also responsible uh, in, a, in a certain way to ensure that whatever is being done with your software is safe. So this is the um, uh, this is the context we are in. So of course um, the question is: Do we ha all have to be? Do we want to be liable for everything? No, probably not. If we, there's a a way to uh, divest that, um, of course we will be open to do that. Um, but I think we are not yet there. We have to get. We have to uh, get there. So there are two things we could think about with respect to that. The first thing is, the, the most dangerous thing that a human being can do to modify their car is to make uneven the inflation pressures of their tires. And nobody would ever say that General Motors is going to be responsible because Jimmy decided he liked 15 pounds per square inch in the left rear tire and 45 pounds per square inch on the front passenger tire. The resulting wrapped around a telephone pole experience is not regarded as the manufacturer's problem. There was a user modification and it was deadly. Uh, it's way more yeah. dangerous than screwing with the VLC Absolutely. that plays the entertainment video in the back seat for your kids so that the volume control will never go past four, which I predict will be a popular modification, right? The, the, we need to understand the scale at which what we're trying to do is figure out what forms of software modification are actually not a problem after we have given the manufacturer tools that allow it to control the stuff that really is a problem quite heavily while not controlling that which is not. And no license can do that, no bunch of legal words can do that. There has to be a technical infrastructure connected with the way software is put together and distributed that gives us that. What Mark is saying about Ubuntu Core as another edition of the software is that the people who have been most innovative in distributing FOSS in the last generation and who changed the software industry around the world by doing it are now concentrating on that question because of IoT, because of the automobile, because of all that complex stuff at the edge. We're now going to learn to package and distribute software with all that kind of sensitive I want to find a way of bridging the remaining legal difficulties, whether it's GPL3 or your concerns about how LGPL 2.1 works. Or I, I want to take all of that legal material and reshape it just a little bit around the edges so that we can understand how it works compatibly with new packaging structures 
to give manufacturers fine-grained enough control that they can relax their concern about user modification. They live with the fact that you can't control tire inflation pressures from the moment the car leaves the factory. They know that there's no TiVo icing the, the pressure valves in the tires. They understand that there's no way that every single thing can be controlled in the interest of safety and in the interest of liability limitation. But there are obvious things that we would like to be able to do, including to have a computer in the car which constantly monitors tire pressures and which puts a note up on the dashboard if something is wrong, right? Which is software we might allow people to modify, but we might also allow them to modify it only in certain ways. And we would certainly want to have control over provenance. You don't want me modifying your tire pressure gauges in your car with an over-the-air exactly. modification. Exactly. And this, again, is one of the things that Mark and I are trying to address in the paper to explain how we can use digital signatures and blockchain publication and other things so that everybody, NT, NHTSA after a crash and uh, third party manufacturers and police investigators can all know exactly what was the software in the car and who put it there. That's going to be a critical part of trust and a critical part of law in the 21st century. If somebody made a modification to a Tesla's um, autopilot software and it wound up in the middle of a median divider on a highway at 75 miles an hour, who changed those bits is going to be a very important story. Right? I, f I, fully, I fully agree, uh, Eben. I think I um, fully agree with your point of view. We have to find ways to, to, to be able to have a differentiated uh, view to certain things. Uh, and we have to think of how we can we can get there. I think I put up some ideas how we could get there. Um, I think um, you, Mark, and, and Aben also showed a way. I think uh, we have to be open, and I would like to, and I think it's a good discussion to to be open-minded to to understand how we can get there in order to uh, accomplish all of that. Sure, Nicholas. Um. Hello, here, Nicholas. I'll give you my microphone. You can also turn on the so, microphone. Uh, be before you go into um, user modified versus uh, or the problem of user modified, what is the expected expected modification rate of the OEMs? And that is so extraordinarily high already that you, with your current model, can't even handle that. And that's why I think the, the discussion about is it um, the traditional model versus the user modified model is actually the wrong discussion. It's the discussion that we need for the automotive industry is the traditional I control the software versus I have a highly dynamic software that I'm going to be updating probably at something like every two weeks once I have the complexity of an autonomous vehicle. And if you can solve that problem, extending that for user modifiability will be significantly easier. But as long as we discuss from these two very far apart um, sides, I don't think we're going to get close. Yeah, it's uh, uh, difficult to, to answer because I didn't even, uh, uh, clearly get the, the question. But um, um, of course, we have this two-sided um, views. Uh, I th I, how I understood yourself was uh, that we should combine um, the two things, but um, yes, I think, of course, there will be updates and probably even regular if you see it with the uh, everyday device of uh, everyone is using today, there will, there will be updates every second day, every day. And this will happen um, uh, also with, with cars in the future. The more software will, will get incorporated in, in our cars. Um, still, however, I, I think we should, when we have to differentiate a little bit about what the individual user do, does, coming back to Eben's uh, um, example, if, he, if the customer um, modifies his individual car and, and his tire pressure, of course, he can do so. And this is his own, own risk, and uh, I, I don't want to prevent him. I would like to do it in some cases, but 
Um, this is his uh, personal um, decision to do so, but if he then makes this public and uh, gives a solution to, to other people, then I think we are in a position and we have to, we at least we have to not control it, but at least know that and, and uh, have a position how we react to that. There's a, there's a reference earlier, sort of tangentially to regulation and liability. And what's interesting for me um, is that this narrative often plays out as a contest of wills between the private individual and the institution and the institution's commercial interests. But the really interesting cases are all typically regulated. And so the, the, the balance of interests is much more complex than just a private individual and an institution. Um, and I guess in, in a sense, all of our interests are represented in the regulatory function. All of our interests are represented in, in um, uh, uh, civil um, behaviors and decisions. I think it's really important that we figure out mechanisms to represent those stories. You know? <clears throat> we may well come to the view that actually that is very helpful to manufacturers because it essentially starts to establish the limits of their control or the limits of their the expectation of control and therefore liability, right? Anything that essentially is on public roads or anything that is essentially in a public environment um, becomes something like a, a shared responsibility. And having a clear limitation on what you're expected to enforce potentially is helpful in, in the bigger picture. Mr. McGuire's point that the amount of modification occurring in the software and vehicles is going to be extremely high mm -hmm. all the time, I think is unanswerably correct, right? That the, 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 once we are talking about software doing the driving, it is going to be updated all the time to take account of all kinds of experience that was unexpected. <coughs> and even before we get to that, Look, there is an argument that the anti-lock braking software, which we all want to think of as you do it once and you do it right and you never let anybody change it again, really ought to be changed according to weather conditions and all sorts of other subjects, and that we really ought to want a high degree of software volatility inside the vehicle. But without strong governance principles, including the ability to roll back halfway, we're going to wind up in a world where automobiles that can kill people are no more successful at completing their updates than Windows 10 objects. After all, pardon me, Justin, it's hard for me to imagine. I have friends in Microsoft. I need to be careful about what I say about them in public. But let's face it, even in a comparatively simple environment called one device we provide the operating system, or high dynamism in updating is a terrible, terrible problem, and we need better tools for it. I also think there's something Jeremiah said, which is critically important at this moment when we talk about regulation. In the world that the governments are now looking at, it is the data generated around the car, which is the greatest and most important subject. All this other stuff is tr comparatively traditional. Now, there are two ways of thinking about that, one of which is that all the data generated around the vehicle is going to be regulated and government controlled, and the other way is my way, which is that better not happen. And one of the most important elements in what users of automobiles and other vehicles and autonomous systems in the 21st century are going to want the power to modify is the leakage of the data. I'm okay with my car having as much tendency to be chatty about who I am and where I'm going as is minimally necessary in order to achieve certain agreed upon social goals. And after, after that, right? I mean, I live a reasonably effective life in the net without a Google account, without a Twitter account, without a Facebook account, without a platform relationship of any kind. Please don't tell me that in order to own an automobile in the 21st century, I'm going to have to be more risky with my personal data and the substance of my life than I am already. And that surely means that there are going to be levels of desire for user control over the way software and vehicles work, which are extremely valuable to the individual, extremely important to manufacturers and service platforms, and extremely interesting to government regulators. The rules about all of that have to be adaptable 
We have to be able to have that social policy conversation in a serious way. And without some kind of technology for governance of user modifications of the software in the cars, we can't have the conversation at all. This is why, Nicholas, from my point of view, it's not only about the question of the dynamism of the software environment. It is, in the end, also about who has rights. Because I think the rights package that was involved in the 20th century automobile which was basically the open road and the freedom of people, which the automobile came to stand for, had better not be the opposite of the 21st century meaning of the package. That the automobile is a form of social control for whoever owns it, runs it, services it, manages it, not for the person who we used to quaintly think of as the driver of it. And, and from that point of view, it seems to me how the software is governed and how it is updated and who has the right to update it is going to be terribly important to all of us. Of course I am concerned about my safety. Of course I do not want my brakes to fail when I pump the pedal. But I also don't want the automobile ratting me out every place I go to people I can't do anything about. Oh, no. You're still pumping your pedal, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> oh no, I, I, no, 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 on the contrary, I don't trust, I, I, I don't trust anti-lock brakes on an icy road. And that's, and, and that's an example of software failure I have experienced in my life from time to time. Of course I pump the brakes. Tough shit if the software thinks I'm not going. <laughs> Other questions? Depends on what comment. Yeah, I'd like to make a couple of comments uh, pertaining, I guess, to the auto industry. Was it Ralph Nader who wrote the book Unsafe at Any Speed? about the Corvair and the garbage that uh, General Motors produced uh, many years ago and apparently continues to produce today. Uh, but I'm wondering about when the cell phones came along and we see uh, a spike in auto accidents and uh, followed by auto deaths. And I believe last year auto deaths in the US were approximately 34,000. So I wondered, with the automotive manufacturers loading up distraction device after distraction device on the dashboard where you can watch a video, tune into the internet, and, and generally get distracted. So the auto desk, you know, do the manufacturers really give a, a damn? And I'd say not really. And then in terms of the auto industry moving to Mexico, South Korea, and China. And then when you look at the J.D. Powers quality control study of autos, I think there's one U.S. automaker in the top 10. Uh, fortunately, Audi is in the top 10, along with uh, Lexus, Toyota, Honda, et cetera, Nissan. Uh, so I guess my last point is to, uh, to Daniel. Uh, can you comment about the fact that BMW and Mercedes have recently announced a joint venture? I believe it's really to counter the power of Google, uh, Tesla, and Apple, where the automobile becomes the software machine on wheels, and the Germans don't want to be squeezed out of the business by Silicon Valley. So over to you, Daniel. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it was a bunch of um, remarks and questions, uh, but maybe to start with the, with the last. Um, I've been uh, talking to the, uh, the big players in the Silicon Valley as well because I've been uh, legally involved as well. And I know from our departments that we are, of course, uh, doing the same. Uh, We're trying to, uh, to, to, we understand that there our interests uh, to come up with software solutions. We are trying to uh, match and, and uh, match those uh, um, interests with coming up with own solutions. It's either in the automotive industry with other uh, automotive companies or within the group where we have uh, more than 13 brands, uh, or not more than at least 13 brands. Um, at the moment, we have a big power and interesting power in order to, uh, to be uh, competitive to the other, so we don't have to fear it, we have to watch that very closely. But you mentioned also in the very beginning a part which said um, that uh, distraction in the car is is uh, of, uh, um, or, or you, you mentioned the, the, uh, the producers don't give a damn. 
uh, in the contrary, we give a lot of it. We know, um, I, in, in my department at least, we have uh, um, so engineers uh, which care about a lot about uh, product liability and um, I work with them very closely and uh, s uh, distraction in a car is of a high importance, at least in, in our company. So um, we, we don't allow um, things to, to uh, move, as you said, we don't allow that. So whenever the car starts moving, everything is shut down. Of course, I cannot prevent a customer to put his uh, uh, phone somewhere in his uh, um, field to attach it somewhere and to watch that. I cannot prevent that. Even, but even we are we are we are looking at it and we're trying to see if there's a cable connected. We try to stop that. Um, but this is a, a, a very wide field. We can discuss about that a long time. But we care a lot about the, those issues. A so lot not not th the customer get to get distracted by whatever is there. Many car companies, I think, all care about safety. I think they care a lot more than we imagine because I think that the message that that gets out into Society is, is much more commercial, it's much more selling. And I think that they realize they need to adjust their message. But they absolutely do. And in fact, car companies like Volvo, that is their differentiation. They, safety is the di differentiation. They invented the three-point seat belt, for example. And they are going to try and go this approach that even was talking. You know, the CEO of Volvo says that they stand for the liability of their <coughs> autonomous vehicle systems. Now, that's really good. We want that. We want, as consumers, somebody to choke uh, when something goes wrong. We want to hold their feet to the fire. But, you know, that car is going to be built with FOSS, and they are going to use GPLv3, and we're going to have to have a way to make sure that's all done the right way. Um, and that's obviously the, the topic of this event, but it gets back to the point about safety. Who is responsible? Who's you know, how's that going to be done? And a lot of this autonomous driving, though it presents a dystopia where the car drives you to jail or, or what have you, the, the fact is, is that small amounts of that um, are going to save lives. But it has to work in combination with infrastructure as well. I mean, there are things we can do today that we're not doing, like making traffic systems, the roads, mm -hmm safer. That's done in Sweden. It has the lowest death rate per kilometer traveled. I know New York City has talked with Sweden, but you know, <laughs> every country needs to do that. Um, that need, that's a big priority, and it's not on the car makers to do that work. What can we learn from the custom car movement in the 1950s and 60s? I mean, we used to modify everything all the time. You know, it was not considered cool to be driving a standard version of a car. So how can that inform this? And thank you. I think I think uh, what you were mentioning or striving is uh, uh, leg leg legitimate, uh, legitimate. Sorry, um, and I think this is something we will see also in the in the future. So the customer has and should have the freedom to do exactly this um, for his own product. Um, if it comes to that this is something which can be and should be used in a more wide space, on a more open space, then of course there needs to be a check somewhere if this is matching the overall security standards and safety standards. You know, in but the past, as, you know, so what do we learn? Think. I think we learned two things. I, I think the first thing that we learn is that the industry benefited from user innovation substantially. It picked up a lot of tricks from people in the street over the years. It picked them up with respect to design. It picked them up with respect to the, uh, the, the uh, forms of fashionable operation, whether low riding, high riding, loud mufflers, not so loud. Uh, but the other thing that we should learn from it is that the automobile was an extraordinary technical university for the human race. There were people all over the human race who learned things about technology and who learned how to make a living by working on cars. Cars were a vehicle for the education of people in the technologies that cars contained. And that knowledge flowed out into vernacular technical cultures of all kinds around the world. 
This was a lesson we learned in the free software movement, right? I mean, that's why I, I said two decades ago, free software is the greatest technical reference library ever assembled on earth because it's the only way that a person without skill yet in the art can learn from the very best that is being done in all the ways that are being done just by reading stuff you can get for free. We want the automobile to continue to be the seed of vernacular technical education in the world. We can't do that if people can't modify the car. This was the point about GPL3's anti-lockdown provision in the first place. We were trying to preserve what we understood to be the way people in the world became technically highly capable, namely by hacking on their own things. And we did not want the level of things in the world locked down that young people couldn't learn to program on to go up too high. That always seemed to us a global north-south issue. In the north, there were lots of people. If they bought one computer that was locked down, they could buy another computer that was not locked down. Linus Torvalds was a good example. It didn't bother him. He didn't need to worry about it. He could buy another computer. But all over the world, there are people who have exactly one, and it would be good if they could hack on it, because that's where they're going to learn. This should also be true about the car in the 21st century, because we saw how important it was in the 20th. So for me, the stakes in the modifiability of the technology include all the human learning that will flow from that, which is a vast welfare loss to the world if the machines are not willing to allow people to learn from them. And that means ability to read and to understand, but it also means the ability to experiment. Sure, it's more dangerous when it's an object that travels at high speed. And therefore, it would be really good if we were clever about it. Like, you know, the GPS in the car tells the software agent, no more modifications now. He's on a smart road. He has to be totally in sync with all that complex built environment around him. Or, nah, he's in the middle of the back of beyond on his own real estate in a rural county. Let him do whatever the hell he wants to do. And to have the ability to move back and forth between a highly regulated software state on a smart road and a less regulated software state somewhere else, all of that lies within our existing technical capacity. So if we have the technical capacity to do those things, we should. Because what I think we learned from the 21st, 20th century history of the car was that technical enablement was really valuable to people. It made an enormous difference in people's intellectual and economic development and in their lives. As I've traveled around the world in the last lifetime of mine, I have certainly seen an awful lot of things that were done by modifying cars that car industries learned from and more important that people And whether it was on a Caribbean island where everybody was using right dri left drive cars for right, dri right side of the road driving or whether it was the adaptations of the self uh, worked out propane conversions in uh, countries in the global south or whether it is the miracle of the auto rickshaw. We may not want to ride in them, but it's a miracle that they exist and they stay on the road decade after decade with guys doing fixes at the end of the day and putting stuff together with spit and bailing wire. All of that comes from the history you're talking about, that the automobile was a highly sophisticated, very complex, but also very enabling technology that people interacted with in a whole bunch of ways that we now call hacking. And it worked really, really well. You, you, I'm sorry, you described a brand. Was it like a Dodge Mopar? Mopar. And was that a sort of a modified? Right. Okay. So I have to ask because because I'm a lot younger than I look, and and my memories of the 50s and 60s are entirely manufactured from watching movies made before I was born. But my impression is that you know this was the first time when pretty much every family got access to a car, and cars were super cool. They were still just a little exclusive, but not really that exclusive. And what you're describing reminds me so much of the this, the importance of tapping into passion tapping into enthusiasms. And this is, this is true of, for every brand. It's easy to forget once you've become successful. You think that it's you that makes you successful, but it's not really, right? It's people's passion for what you mean to them and so on. So 
we see this in, in, in our little way in, in the existence of derivatives of Ubuntu, right? People who have different passions to us, um, but it's easiest for them to express those passions starting with, with Ubuntu. And we just grant them the rights to do that because it costs us nothing. And the reality is it's interesting what they do. It's much more interesting what they do often than anything I might do in a day. And it generates enthusiasm, it generates activity. I can see real value for that in, for example, a car or another object manufacturer being able to say, look, as long as I can bound these things, I don't mind allowing the creation of a Mopar, right? Uh, an enthusiast sort of derivative effectively. I can, as long as I can bound the pieces that where I may have a regulatory issue effectively, that is actually a huge asset to me because all of that time, all of that energy, all of that thinking is effectively much more directly applicable to me than it is to any of my competitors. And so we may well see, you know, as soon as we have the ability to start drawing these distinctions, that that kind of fan club um, uh, enthusiasm is, is both enabled and encouraged. Can I just ask, um, which regulator has agency in all of this and what's being done to ensure there's more consistency across regulations in the various sectors? All of them. Yes, and no. Um, I don't think that there's a single governing body. In fact, part of the issue is that you have, for example, right to repair laws in, in Massachusetts that don't necessarily exist in other states. You have CARB, the California Air Regulatory Board, which basically sets policy for the United States when the federal government is not fighting them doing so. And then you have jurisdictions across uh, the rest of the world, which may match or may be completely opposed. And then you have governments that both want to create new regulations for new income streams, as well as preserve a uh, differentiation or an opportunity for their own automotive industries to be competitive. So I, yeah, that kind of harmonization, I, I don't see it existing any time. I, I just to add it, I, I don't see that as well. So um, they are all multinational or every uh, national authority has uh, his own view to that. But um, uh, and I, I don't see that there's something being done in order to uh, bring everything together. But I would like to see the eyes of the regulator, um, wherever uh, nation we look now, if, if we tell him, okay, we have uh, produced and um, certified a car, and we have allowed the customer to, to do whatever he wants with uh, the car, and he, by the way, he's just driving down the road here. I wanna see the eyes of the, uh, the regulator. So I think there's a lot to do and to, to discuss on, on, on the side of the regula regula regulators um, to also to make them understand um, uh, to make them understand uh, the issue of FOSS being used in, in, uh, in cars. There's a regulator in the audience. This is your time. Um, other questions? Yeah, quick follow up for Jeremiah. Uh, Jeremiah, you mentioned the safety of Volvo. Uh, well. As you well know, Volvo is now a Chinese company that has said that they're going to switch over to ele electronic vehicles completely. Is it in 2022 or something like that? So again, we have the Chinese to look to for a global technology leadership in a green environment with less CO2 put into the atmosphere. Is Mr. Trump listening? Less CO2 into the atmosphere because we don't want to have to move to Mars. Yeah, I, I think Mr. Trump has other concerns at the moment. But um, yeah, I think there's great concern among states for in, uh, environmental health of their people. I think that's what drove Ameri American regulators. I think that's what drives German regulators. Swedish, etc. Um, huge issue. Yeah. Other questions? Um, I think it's lunchtime. These are important issues. Software governance is definitely not sufficient at, in its current form right now uh, in automobiles. But we have an entire afternoon of interesting presentations. So. Um, 
now we'll move to lunch and then we will reconvene at 1.30 to ask further questions and grill these people. Thank you. Thank you.